Hello, good evening, good afternoon, and a very good morning to everyone joining us from wherever you are today. On day two of EPIC 2020, Asia Pacific Intensive Care Symposium, organized by the Society of Intensive Care Medicine, Singapore. My name is Tipper Thiers. I'm a respiratory and critical care physician from the National University Hospital, Singapore, and I'll be your moderator for our plenary session today. This morning, it is our honor and pleasure to have Professor Paul Anantaraja Tambaya to share with us on COVID-19 lessons from Singapore ID. Professor Tambaya completed his infectious diseases training at the University of Wisconsin under Dr. Dennis Markey, the world-renowned infectious disease expert and one of the pioneers of critical care medicine. Since returning to Singapore more than 20 years ago, Prof Tambaya has been involved in a number of national and international committees, including being founding head of the Division of Infectious Diseases at the National University Hospital Singapore, Assistant Dean Education at the Yong Lulin School of Medicine, and past president of the Society of Infectious Diseases Singapore. He is currently president of the Asia Pacific Society of Clinical Microbiology and Infection, and president elect of the International Society of Infectious Diseases. His main research interests are device associated infections and emerging infectious diseases. Without further ado, Professor Tambaya, please. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction and thank you for inviting me to this uh, um, um, meeting. Uh, I must say I learned a lot. Uh, I, I tuned in for some of the sessions yesterday um, and I have to admit that I am nowhere near the same amount of uh, high-tech uh, intensive care uh, input that I'm going to be providing here because I, I'm just an infectious disease physician. So I'm going to be sharing with you some of the infectious disease, and in particular in my area, the uh, points of view about transmission. Um, you know, one of the things uh, I forgot to mention to Pipetius is that uh, I actually have a joint appointment at the National Center for Infectious Disease, which I've just stepped down from. Uh, and I was the head of the research collaborating office. And what we did is we give small grants or fellowships for people to travel to international centers uh, to go and pick up some skills. So one of the grants we gave, fellowships we gave, was to this uh, scientist from ASTAR to go to the Wuhan Institute of Virology um, to spend 10 days there. Uh, she sent me an email at the end of January and she said there's a virus in Wuhan that spread over the whole of China. She's canceling her trip, cancels hotel, wants a refund on the air ticket. Now I'm terribly ashamed to admit that I sent an email back on the 22nd of January saying we should try to reimburse her only if she can provide documentation she was actually told not to go. If she's just scared of getting pneumonia, we should not reimburse her. And of course, you know, I was completely wrong. Now we have an epidemic which has affected tens of millions of people, I think it's like 40 something million people and, uh, and killed uh, more than a million individuals. So again, I'm a clinician. I spend a lot of my time looking after patients. And this is one patient I was involved with rather remotely. 72 year old woman with only mild diabetes, felt unwell with some dizziness, went out with her friends in the morning. She became drowsy on returning home. They called an ambulance. She collapsed in the ambulance, was resuscitated and intubated. And by the time she got to the emergency department, I think you all know she had a massive intracranial hemorrhage. She was terminally extubated, but an alert emergency department doctor uh, looked at her chest x-ray, said this doesn't look like aspiration from somebody who had an intracranial hemorrhage, and called me up as I was ID physician on call. And she said, should I do a SARS-CoV-2 uh, PCR? And I said, there's no harm but I don't think we, this is a high risk case because this was in July when the numbers in the community were going down. So I said, just do the PCR, collect the list of family members' names. You don't have to sort of you know, quarantine them or anything. I don't think it's gonna be positive. And once again, I was wrong. It turned out to be positive. Uh, she passed away. Uh, we did the serology just to confirm it. And true enough, she was a zero positive. Uh, and what they did was they quarantined the, the seven or eight individuals who had been in uh, before she passed away. The case was reported in the media. Um, and interestingly enough, she was not one of those counted as a SARS-CoV death because Singapore tends to use a very rigorous, uh, the old WHO definition for, uh, for COVID deaths, which only counts those with pneumonia. <clears throat> There's been a lot of questions about the mortality rate for COVID. And basically, you know, the reality is that the case fatality rate depends on the age. Uh, Singapore's death rate, uh, as far as I can tell from the last published data that we have, uh, the case fatality rate among those 80 and above is 
which is almost identical to the case fatality rate in Spain, China, Italy, and Korea. So this virus somehow seems to behave about the same wherever you are. And this may be a bit of a disappointment for you ICU docs. The other interesting thing is that this virus um, is not just pulmonary disease. Although it does involve the, uh, the alveoli uh, inflammation, pulmonary disease, uh, stuff that you guys know so well. But there's also this second component, the component of thrombosis and vascular pathology, um, which I think contributed to our patient's uh, uh, demise. So another illustration, 22-year-old South Asian migrant worker lived in a dormitory, fever for five days, dry cough and osmia, loss of taste, conjunctivitis, uh, a bit hypotensive, tachycardic, uh, two days prior, he had a routine screening, which was COVID positive. Chest x-ray, pretty unremarkable, a bit of a large heart, but it was a portable x-ray uh, and a uh, kind of muffling of his skin. Um, he got an ECG and it showed some acute uh, um, ST elevation. Uh, his C-reactive protein was markedly elevated. Ferritin was elevated. Top eye was also elevated. He was managed conservatively and he actually did pretty well and was discharged from the hospital. So we've got myocarditis, we've got vascular disease, and this disease behaves in, in very different ways in different people. However, the most common presentation of COVID worldwide is actually uh, in young healthy people in which they are largely asymptomatic. So this is a woman who works in our hospital. She felt a bit unwell early in February, saw her general practitioner, was given clarithromycin, some rest at home, developed a bit of shortness of breath, saw the GP again, referred to the emergency department, was discharged, uh, was off, wanted to come back to work, had a swab done, which was PCR positive. By this time, she was completely asymptomatic, but she was kept in hospital because at that time, we kept everyone in hospital until they had two negative PCR swabs, and she was finally discharged on the 27th of February. <clears throat> what, what is important about this case, though, is that she was part of a chain of transmission that was linked uh, to two visitors from Wuhan, to a couple of churches and a family gathering. And this is what Singapore did really well at the beginning of the outbreak, very detailed contact tracing investigations to try and nail down the spread of each case. In fact, this was published in The Lancet, and it's a very striking investigation because it showed that actually the two index cases had no contact whatsoever. They didn't even, <clears throat> uh, weren't even in the church at the same time as the subsequent cases. So these two individuals attended the morning service, uh, left immediately after the service, did not have lunch in church, but they occupied the same seat. And this is hugely controversial because there's this issue of fomite transmission um, that even though they didn't meet, they, they, they occupied the same seat. Um, the contact tracing people managed to contact 191 members of the church. Uh, they screened them for symptoms, six were unwell, and none of them tested positive. So if this virus is actually airborne transmitted, it's got to be the least efficiently airborne transmitted virus in history. But unfortunately, this idea of airborne transmission is very widespread. And I put it down to the, <clears throat> the miasma theory, which reigned in medicine from the time of Hippocrates to the time of Pasteur. And you know, this is a cartoon of how cholera was believed to be spread by, uh, by bad air. You know, malaria is known as malaria, bad air. <clears throat> and this has been fueled <clears throat> by experimental studies such as this one, which was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, where they actually managed to find uh, aerosols containing viable virus up to three hours after the uh, inoculation. But you know what I tell my medical students is you should always read the fine print. And if you read the supplementary appendix of that paper, you'll realize that they used a very high concentration of virus uh, they used a high-powered uh, nebulizer to aerosolize the virus, and they kept it in a drum, which is used actually for testing for bioterrorism uh, agents. So these are very uh, controlled and experimental settings, in which case you can see aerosolization of the virus for a prolonged period of time. In contrast, in real life at the Singapore's National Center for Infectious Disease, um, they found virus in multiple sites in the rooms of patients in negative pressure rooms, <clears throat> they found it on the bed rail, they found it on the call bell, uh, they found it on the handrail, in the sink, in the toilet. Uh, they didn't find it in the ante room, which is good, but they didn't find any in the air, even though it was in the air exhaust uh, uh, area. Uh, the people from the University of Nebraska, who are great believers in airborne transmission, in fact, they helped to design the negative pressure rooms at the NCID. 
they found virus uh, RNA in, in air samples, but they could not find culturable virus. So this has been, again, like I said, a huge controversy until this study, which was published just last month uh, from the University of Florida. And they finally found viable virus in the rooms of two patients. But this study is a bit peculiar because this patient was actually about to be discharged and he was PCR negative for the virus, and yet the air samples found virus. So there are some questions as to where the virus came from and whether there was some contamination occurring in the setup uh, in this, in this uh, experiment. So, but like I said, it's become a hugely emotional issue. Uh, you may have seen there were 239 scientists who wrote to the WHO an open letter demanding that airborne transmission be considered. If you wondered why it's 239, I think it may be because they asked me to sign the letter and I refused to sign the letter as I don't believe in airborne transmission. So instead of 240, it became 239. Maybe it was someone else. So the WHO and the CDC have been in the firing line because uh, the CDC published, withdrew, and then had to water down their comments on aerosol guidance. And the CDC has a guideline development group where they strongly believe that actually, uh, except in the context of aerosol generating procedures, the virus is primarily transmitted by large droplets and contact. Now, this was a huge issue in 2009, which many of us have forgotten. And what happened was there was a large study comparing N95 respirators versus surgical masks, which basically means uh, airborne versus droplet transmission. And this study was received a lot of attention in the media. However, at an Infectious Disease Society of America meeting in Toronto, uh, <clears throat> uh, what happened was the investigators actually withdrew the study. I remember I was chairing that free paper session, and there was a it was a stunned silence initially. And then I asked the presenter, are you actually withdrawing the study? Uh, and she said that they were. And so what happened was the president of Shea, president of the IDSA and president of APIC wrote to President Obama. And they said that, you know, there's no evidence that actually N95 masks are needed for preventing the transmission of influenza. And the poor man, I think he had a lot more on his mind, but that clearly shows you how important this concept was of airborne versus droplet transmission. Now, I personally don't like N95 respirators, and we've done a study among pregnant healthcare workers where we've shown that they actually uh, reduce the tidal volume uh, and actually uh, have a significant impact on minute ventilation when you're breathing through an N95 respirator. Uh, but, you know, the reality is we have to protect our healthcare workers. And this is from SARS. When I show this slide at infection control meetings, they always ask me, why do you need an N95 respirator to answer the phone? And my answer is, you know, a large proportion of Singapore's uh, healthcare workforce comes from overseas. And if a healthcare worker wants an N95 mask to, to answer the phone, we give them an N95 mask to answer the phone. Because if they don't get the N95 mask to answer the phone, they're going to be unhappy, they're going to leave, or we're going to be doomed. So N95 masks were widely available during SARS. In fact, we even had a bank robber using N95 mask to rob a bank. When he found it uncomfortable, he put it on his head, he got caught by the security cameras. Uh, fortunately, after 2009, with more data, bank robbers started using surgical masks, uh, and they now dominate the, the scene both uh, <clears throat> clinically and non-clinically. Now, another interesting illustration during COVID is in what happened in Taiwan. So in Taiwan, as you know, they had uh, strict use of uh, medical masks in the community. They had contact tracing. They've had a relatively well-controlled uh, epidemic. Um, and this is what happened to influenza. Influenza disappeared by, by March and April, no more influenza. But then when they compared it to varicella, now varicella we know is an airborne uh, virus and varicella did not change. So the use of surgical masks or medical masks in the community, the shutting down of schools and all those things, it works for droplet transmitted infections, but it has no impact on an airborne transmitted virus like, like uh, varicella. I know this is ecological data and I'm trying to get the funding to do a proper uh, experimental study to do this. So during H1N1 2009, I insisted on wearing a surgical mask uh, rather than an N95, even though that was supposedly the policy in our emergency department. Second point is that SARS-CoV-2, like SARS, is not easily spread by most people. So this is, again, data from the Singapore Public Health Group, where they showed that the vast majority of individuals had no transmissions, or the most one or two transmissions. But you had a couple of super spreaders, or what we now call super spreading events, which were responsible for the vast majority of transmissions. And this transmissions, the one or two that do occur, tend to occur in, uh, in households. And this was shown in Taiwan, where they showed that the majority of secondary cases occur in households, 
all in family members not from the same household. They had no transmission in healthcare settings despite large numbers of contacts. The same is true in India, where the vast majority of individuals, no transmission, but a small number of super spreaders responsible for large uh, outbreaks. So I'm not a mathematical modeler, but I have friends who are. And a group of us looked early in the outbreak at, at this uh, risk of super spreading events. And what we showed was with stay at home orders, um, this confined SARS-CoV-2 in the households at the expense of increased risk of infection among the household members. And we speculated that this would be particularly so amongst the migrant workers in Singapore, which unfortunately turned out to be true. And the reason is the migrant workers live in large cramped uh, dormitories where you've got 10 to 15 people in a room. And this resulted in multiple spreads across the, the country. The initial cluster of cases in a migrant worker dormitory was very well managed, contact tracing, quarantine of contact, no spread beyond five individuals. However, as the case numbers went up, it became physically impossible to do that. And the focus was on symptomatic individuals, trying to identify those at highest risk of complications and, <clears throat> and actually moving out to the dormitories themselves to provide care so that you protected the, the main uh, healthcare system. So it's actually pretty rough. These, these groups published their data where they worked without chest x-rays or point of care testing, uh, and it was quite significant. There were unfortunately some un unintended consequences of attempts to preserve the main healthcare system. The Ministry of Manpower sent an advisory to employers not to send their workers to hospital unless it's a medical emergency, and as a result of which, the, the potential misses on asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic individuals. The strategy though was very similar to what was done in Japan with the Diamond Princess cruise ship, where the ship was kept anchored off the coast of Yokohama. It protected the, the general public in Tokyo and Yokohama, but unfortunately within the ship, there was large numbers of transmissions until enhanced infection control was put in and individuals were taken off the ship. So the same thing happened again with extraordinarily high attack rates in the dormitories. Uh, this is again the same group. They reported out of 5,977 foreign workers, 1,800 of them were symptomatic, and of them, 69% were found to be positive for COVID-19, which is probably the highest attack rate in the world. <clears throat> so uh, again, one of the problems was the asymptomatic transmission. And this is a paper published in, uh, in February, actually late January in the New England Journal of Medicine, which was attacked. In science, they claimed that this paper was flawed, and they also claimed that somebody from an institute in Germany was going to write to the New England Journal, but it turned out that it was never sent. And so it was a misunderstanding. And uh, this has been, unfortunately, the feature of, of this uh, epidemic, this date information, misinformation, and, and just basically not recognizing that science works by hypothesis, proving hypothesis wrong, coming up with a better hypothesis. And ultimately, this woman, Camilla Rothe, who was the primary author on that paper of pre-symptomatic transmission, was selected as one of the 100 most influential people uh, in the world in 2020. So ultimately, the truth comes out. So in Singapore, again, as you've heard, we've had uh, multiple, we've had imported cases at the beginning, and now we have more imported cases coming out. We've had local transmission. And then if you look at the, the X, the, the X axis here, you'll see, sorry, the Y axis, you'll see that the, the number of cases in the dormitories is actually in the thousands, whereas this is in the tens. So we had huge outbreaks in the migrant worker dormitories that fortunately are finally coming to an end. And this has led to very challenging public health decisions, like the idea of whether you quarantine them, whether you treat them on site, and, and how you do that. And it's exposed the inequality as it has in many countries in the world. So there's also been these issues even before the lockdown, where you have 10 to 15 workers per room with only three fans per room. A uh, number of people sharing a toilet uh, uh, is extraordinarily high. Uh, and these are all uh, has had a mental health impact on the workers, but it's also led to, to transmission of the virus in this setting. One of the concerns is that whether this uh, outbreak is coming to an end because we finally achieved uh, uh, immunity in these workers. Um, there is good evidence that this virus leads to lasting immunity, and this is a study done by researchers at the Duke uh, NUS Medical School together with the Yong Lulin School, led by Professor Antonio Bertoletti. And what they did was essentially collected individuals who had recovered from uh, COVID-19 together with individuals from SARS-CoV-2. And the nice thing is that many people with SARS-CoV-2 uh, in 2000, sorry, SARS-CoV, the original SARS in 2003, 
were healthcare workers. So when this outbreak occurred, so many of them called us up. In fact, one of our intensivists uh, personally called me up. He said, I don't mind giving you a liter of blood so that you can better understand this virus. So anyway, what they did was they took blood from individuals who had recovered from SARS, the original SARS, together with SARS-CoV-2, together with uninfected individuals who had neither of them. And they showed there was a robust T cell response. So what this suggests that even if antibody titers decline, which they do for almost all infections, you're gonna have T cell responses, which when you stimulate the T cells can actively um, tackle the virus. So there's, there's good uh, indication that this might work and it provides hope for the development of a vaccine. So the other approach which we did during H1N1 uh, and which we, are hope we were hoping to do this time around was prophylaxis or chemoprophylaxis. And so we ran a large clinical trial in the migrant worker dormitory to try and see if there's a way to prevent uh, infection in individuals there. And the results of this trial are being reanalyzed even as we speak. Ultimately though, the problem in these dormitories is closed conditions, very hard, people are climbing over each other. And the reality is that in intensive care units, in many of our clinical settings, our tea rooms, our, our work areas are just the same. Uh, fortunately, we have nice homes to go back to, which the migrant workers don't have. And this is data from Singapore General Hospital, where they had a bunch of social workers who, who ended up getting infected. And this is the, the work room that the social workers were in. It's right next to the clinical area. And you can see it's, it's impossible to really maintain a decent social distance with a full complement of people working there. So ultimately, we live, or we maybe we lived, I don't know what's, when travel is going to come back, in a globalized world, and no one is truly safe until everyone is truly safe. Thank you. I'll take questions. Thanks very much, Prof, for that uh, very entertaining and informative talk. Uh, we'll await some questions, uh, which uh, the audience can please feel free to post on our uh, Q&A. Uh, there are no questions uh, for now, but uh, Prof, I do have uh, some questions for you. Uh, I think my first question is, Prof, how do you think we managed to escape an outbreak uh, within our conscript NS population, given that they're also cohabiting in post close proximity, not very different to our migrant worker population? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. And in fact, um, I think you will remember H1N1 2009, uh, the big outbreaks were in national service populations. And I think part of the thing is that um, the introductions, see the migrant worker population, uh, we believe that the, uh, the outbreak was introduced uh, by uh, travelers possibly from Malaysia. And the, uh, at the time that the Malaysian outbreak occurred, uh, and you know that there was this uh, big cluster around Mustafa's. So for the, for the, um, for the conscripts, you know, the, uh, the big community clusters were Safra Jurong. So uh, uh, places where elderly people or, you know, um, so, so the interaction between the outbreak and the migrant population and the conscript uh, national service population was not that close. You know, presumably the NS men during the weekends, they don't spend that much time with their grandparents. So, so, the, uh, so the opportunity for introduction was not there until the SAF had time to put in measures. So it's the breathing space. And in fact, this is the, the lesson that we've learned is that you, know, you really need to be aware of what's going on outside uh, so that you have time to put in measures quickly. And, and once you put in the measures, um, you have a chance to, to do something about it. If you miss the measures, you, know, you, you can put in the measures when there are five or six cases. You try and put in the measures when there are 50 cases, 100 cases, it's nearly impossible to do. You know, uh, even Singapore's really well-oiled public health people, they really struggle and, and, uh, and that's the consequence over. Thanks, Prof. Uh, we have a question posed for you yeah. uh, on what you think the role of routine rostered testing for healthcare workers at the front lines. What do you think about that? Yeah, that's an interesting question because um, you know in some uh, hospitals in the U.S. they do uh, they do routine testing, um, but in Singapore we haven't done healthcare worker testing. In fact, uh, my sister uh, who lives in the U.K. she said. Uh, she can't believe that I've looked after more than a thousand patients with uh, COVID and taken consent from several hundred. I haven't been tested. So, uh, so I think at the moment, uh, there's, there's not good enough uh, data on this. I think what we might do is, is move to like hepatitis B. You know, hepatitis B, we, we test the healthcare workers who are at highest risk, like the surgeons, the OT nurses. So if you are going to have close contact maybe with the elderly, 
uh, or with those who are vulnerable, then perhaps if we have a, a, a rapid and accurate point of care test, then that might be something that we can consider. But for the moment, I think it's not a great idea. Over. Uh, thanks, Prof. And I think uh, on the topic of lessons, uh, because we do know that the fight for COVID-19 is far from over, but looking back now, if there's uh, one thing you could change about our approach uh, to COVID-19, what would that one thing be and why? Yeah, you know, I think as a scientific community, um, we, we sort of let down the, the general public. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm a researcher, and I think we should have answered this question about the mode of transmission a lot earlier in January or February. In fact, there are studies that have been done, how do we know about varicella and TB? And this is actually through animal studies. So what they do is they, these people in Peru, uh, they put guinea pigs who are susceptible to TB in the rooms of patients with cavitary TB. And then they find out that actually, even though they're separated some distance, they're put in the ventilation duct, they can still get infected. So we know that TB is airborne in transmission. Because if we, if we knew the mode of transmission, then I think we wouldn't need to do such some of these drastic lockdowns. Because if the transmission is primarily in households, then the focus could be on contact tracing, the focus could be on protecting the vulnerable, rather than, you know, I mean, I, I really miss going to a concert, you know. Uh, when they reopened theater, my wife and I, we bought tickets straight away because it's, 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 been, it's been really, uh, you know, crippling to, uh, to cultural life, uh, all of this. Over. Uh, thanks, Prof. We have two more questions on the uh, chat right now. Uh, I'll group uh, one of them on the uh, vaccines uh, together. Uh, firstly, uh, how efficient you think the vaccine can be once it's developed, uh, taking into account the various mutations of COVID-19, and uh, whether you think we can achieve an effective vaccination rate for uh, COVID in Singapore, and uh, what we can do to increase it. Okay, two very good questions. Uh, in terms of mutations, actually the mutation rate in COVID-19 uh, is very low uh, compared to a lot of the other viruses. And uh, we, we see uh, isolated mutations, but in fact, the, the clade that's currently circulating, uh, the D614G is, is very dominant worldwide. So I have a lot of confidence that uh, vaccine is gonna work. Um, next question about high effective vaccination rate, that's going to be really hard. Singapore has a very low uh, vaccination rate for influenza. You know, Singaporeans tend to think of vaccination as something for kids, not for adults. So I think it's going to be challenging. The messaging has got to come across uh, before it works. Over. Thanks. Uh, we have another question uh, about whether you think an individual who has survived SARS uh, still be as susceptible to contracting uh, SARS-CoV-2 COVID? And if so, do you think their symptoms uh, would end up being much milder than someone who has never contracted SARS or H1N1? Yes, and actually I've asked friends in uh, Hong Kong, Taiwan and Canada, and so far I haven't seen anyone who recovered from SARS who's got um, uh, COVID-19. But then again, the numbers are relatively small. Remember worldwide, there are only 8,000 people who got, uh, um, who got SARS. Uh, there's actually a human challenge model for COVID-19 that's being developed in the UK. So the big question is whether one person is going to volunteer and you see whether there's actually going to be infection or not. But uh, I think uh, based on the experimental data, it suggests that um, um, people with SARS are actually probably going to be immune uh, to COVID-19. Thank you. Uh, and I think that's the uh, one magic question we all want to know, how long you think this will go on for. Uh, the question posed is actually Spanish flu went on for two years in 1918. And the world has changed drastically since then. And how do you think this pandemic is going to play out? Yeah, you know, I was the one who was optimistic. And I thought when the summer came in the Northern Hemisphere, the virus would disappear. But instead of which, it bounced down and you got outbreaks in Brazil and in Australia and New Zealand and places like that. So uh, it's very hard to predict. But, um, you know, I think uh, what we are seeing is uh, possibly the adaptation of the virus. So we're seeing large numbers of cases, we're seeing exponential rises in cases, but the death rate seems to be relatively flat. So, so if the virus becomes more infective and less lethal, it probably will take about two years uh, before it sort of disappears. Uh, but again, uh, I've been wrong before, I may be wrong again. Thanks, Prof. No worries. We won't hold you to that. Thank you. Uh, so we've come to the end of our session today. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us. And thank you very much, uh, Prof. Tambaya, for sharing with us. Uh, your thoughts uh, on COVID-19 in Singapore. Uh, we'll see the rest of you at the other sessions. Thank you.